Hey there YouTube lovers, my name is BB8 and today we are going to review the remake of Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. I've been waiting to review this for a, quite a while now. I know it's only been out for one month, but since it's a remake of The Thousand Year Door, which is my favourite Paper Mario game. It was the perfect chance to review it on my channel. I wasn't the biggest fan of Sticker Star or Color Splash, since their combat systems weren't on par with Paper Mario 64 or The Thousand Year Door, but since this is a remake of Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, is it a return to form for the series? You're about to find out. So, Without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? For the gameplay, one of the core elements of the gameplay in Paper Mario of the Thousand Year Door is its turn-based combat system, where timing is essential to dealing damage to enemies. In battle, you could have Mario and one other partner with you at a time, with each of the seven partners having their own purpose in battle which I will explain in the story section. In recent Paper Mario games, I feel like the combat system has made some of them unenjoyable. While the Origami King had a fun enough combat system, it didn't feel the same without partners. Sticker Star did return to turn-based combat since Super Paper Mario focused more on platforming than being a turn-based RPG, but Sticker Star relied on stickers for even using attacks at all. Even a simple jump or a normal hammer attack required stickers to even use them at all, which made it less fun to even play. Unfortunately, Sticker Star ignored the Thousand Year Door in terms of the combat system, Color Splash had a similar situation since it uses battle cards instead of stickers, which you can choose to paint with the Wii U gamepad, and neither Sticker Star nor Color Splash had fun combat systems since they were based on resources that you would find throughout the game instead of always having the attacks in particular ready to go. While the Origami King did have a few steps in the right direction by removing stickers and cards completely, in addition to bringing back partners within battle, which had been missing since the Thousand Year Door, the Origami King's partner system wasn't quite there with the Thousand Year Door, since the partners were pretty forgettable and all of them were tied to the story, meaning that you couldn't choose which partner you had with you depending on the situation you were within the game. The ring system did add a fun enough twist, but I think all of this wasn't enough for the Origami King to actually be off with the original three. I think it's the best of the paper themed Paper Mario games, it just wasn't up there with the Thousand Year Door. But did the Thousand Year Door remake fix the combat system from past games? Honestly, yes, it did. There wasn't a resource-based combat system present, and the combat did a really good job of staying true to the original Thousand Year Door game, with one extra aspect added to it being the Battlemaster, a new Toad character who offers advice to help you in combat, and you can also use this to master different moves from Mario or one of your seven partners. The puzzle design in the Thousand Year Door remake managed to stay true to the original since the game still features star pieces which can be traded in for badges and this time they have an additional purpose of adding in an art gallery for each chapter if you have collected all the star pieces within that area and the shine sprites are used to upgrade partners which grant them a new move. And the shine sprites, just like star pieces, now have a sound gallery where you can listen to the game's soundtrack. But since this section is about exploration and puzzle design, I'm going to come back to the art and sound gallery later in the video. 
but the star pieces and shine sprites can be found by using your partners to access specific areas or if they are just hiding out of sight. You can receive clues on where to find star pieces and shine sprites by talking to a fortune teller in a house below Rogue Pot. For the difficulty level, the chapters in the Thousand Year Door are pretty difficult, but compared to the GameCube original, some quality of life improvements made it slightly easier, such as the new save blocks being added into the overworld, and if you are stuck in a particular area, you can press ZL to get a hint from one of your partners, and if you die during a boss fight, you will respawn right before the boss fight, which is handy for saving a bit of time during gameplay, and in the final boss fight within the Palace of Shadows, a pipe has been added to make it easier to get from the entrance to the Shadow Queen's boss fight. For the graphics and the performance, the updated graphics within the remake of the Thousand Year Door are visually gorgeous. The graphics were better than what I was expecting the game to look like. Because if I'm being honest with the Thousand Year Door, all I was expecting was a remaster upscaled to HD and shadow dropped after a Nintendo Direct. But I'm surprised that they went the full on remake treatment instead of remastering it to HD. The overworld has been retextured to make it pop out a bit more. The UI design, while it stayed true to the original, was reworked to make it look more appealing on modern screens and even some of the 2D models have been upgraded to 3D, such as Hooktail, who looks even better in the remake than he does in the original game. The lighting in each individual area within the game looks amazing. The art style hasn't really changed. Since more recent Paper Mario games had white outlines around each individual character, which kind of made certain characters look less visually appealing, but I think staying true to the original was the right choice, because I don't want to imagine what a 3D model of Hooktail with white outlines around each body part would look like. Unlike the GameCube original, which ran at 60 frames per second, the Nintendo Switch remake ran at 30 frames per second, which may bother a few people who have played the Thousand Year Door, but me? I think the character movements, such as Goombella, still look smooth enough, even with a downgraded frame rate. I think Nintendo's next console will support 60 frames per second, so maybe a patch for the Thousand Year Door can improve the frame rate a bit. Before we get into the characters themselves, I want to mention that the remake does add a fresh coat of paint for its characters in terms of the sound design, since the remake applies unique sound blips for every character's dialogue sounds instead of the same one for every character, which makes it easier to identify each character. So now we're on to the characters themselves. Players will take control of Mario for most of the game, but there are segments within the game where you will play as Peach or Bowser in between chapters, where Peach has her own side plot of trying to escape the x naught fortress on the moon, and Bowser has his own side plot of trying to find each individual that would open the Thousand Year Door alongside his assistant, Kami Cooper. In the Thousand Year Door, Mario has seven permanent partners, with each having their own skill set and writing, but not all of them will be useful in terms of offense in battle. Starting off with Goombella, who was a student of Professor Franklin when she was studying at the University of Goom, in the overworld, Goombella can give Mario information about his surroundings, and in combat, doesn't do much on the offense side of things, but her tattle ability is useful for learning enemy stats such as maximum HP, attack and defense. And it can also be used on bosses 
to know accurately how much health they have. Koops did start off as a cowardly character when he was first introduced, but he did change his ways after Mario and Koops went and fought Hogtail, which changed him into a brave Koopa for his girlfriend, Koopy Koo. In the overworld, Koops can use Shell Toss to reach items that Mario can't, and can even trigger elevator buttons when Mario stands on them, and in battle, Koops is more useful for defense than offense, even though Koops can still use offense moves. Madame Flory, who is a retired actress, who ends up joining Mario to save the punies inside the Great Tree when the Great Tree is in danger. Flurry can blow strong winds to reveal hidden areas and make enemies spin, which can distract them temporarily, and in battle she is mostly used for draining HP from enemies, but she does have wind or cloud based abilities that she can use as well. Yoshi Kid, who is my second favourite partner in the game, Yoshi Kid doesn't have any writing behind him before you encounter him after hatching the egg in the glitz pit. And the reason that Yoshi Kid stands out to me is because he will come out as a different colour depending on the player, depending on how long you spend in the glitz pit before defeat. You can also name Yoshi Kid whatever you want, which I ended up naming mine La Voshi because I ended up with the red Yoshi Kid. In the overworld, Yoshi Kid can help you travel faster and flutter over gaps that Mario can't. In battle, Yoshi Kid has a near perfect skill set to work with, since he can flutter jump, gulp enemies, throw eggs to make enemies smaller, and unleash a stampede of Yoshis on enemies. Vivian is probably my favourite of the seven partners, not only because of her useful skill set, but also because of her writing. Vivian was written differently compared to her sisters Beldum and Marilyn, since she is kind and gentle with other people, and the relationship between Vivian and her sisters is what made her easy to connect with. And Vivian was depicted as a trans woman in the original GameCube release in Japan, but in the 2024 remake, the dialogue in Chapter 4 was rewritten to refer Vivian as a trans woman. Even if this is a family-friendly game, it's great to see more LGBTQ representation. Vivian in the overworld can be used by Mario to hide in the shadows, which is useful for detective parts of the story, such as Three Days of Excess, where Vivian can be used to hide in one of the cabins just for a ghost to appear, and in combat, Vivian has a fairly balanced moveset. Veil and Fiery Jinx being the two most useful moves that she has. And Admiral Bobbery is probably the most useful in terms of offense. Bobbery is another well-written character due to his lack of motivation to sail because his wife Scarlett died in a fever, which Bobbery blamed himself for. In the overworld, Admiral Bobbery can be used to access areas to obtain items by cracking walls, and in combat, Barbary is essential for offense, especially in the final battle with the bob on bast ability. And even though Miss Mouse is an optional partner, since she is the only partner in the game where acquiring her isn't connected to the story, but instead can be acquired through a side quest from the Trouble Center. Miss Mouse is probably the least developed of the seven partners, since she is an in and out character throughout the game, as she appears in chapters 1, 2, and 3, but only for a little bit of time. In the overworld, she can be used as a radar to find things such as star pieces and shine sprites, and in combat, she can be used to affect stats of enemies, such as the Love Slap, which can deal 
damage by ignoring the enemy's defense. Kiss Thief, which steals any item or badge the enemy might have. Tease, which can make enemies dizzy. And Smooch, which can replenish 10 HP for Mario. For the story, the main story follows Mario as he collects the seven crystal stars to open the thousand year door and uncover the ancient treasure. The prologue starts the story in Rogueport, where Mario uncovers the, the first clues about the crystal stars and meets her first partner, Boom Bella, and her former professor, Professor Franklin. Chapter one is where the first star piece is found, the Diamond Star. As Mario has to travel through Petal Meadows, where he meets Koops, who starts off as cowardly, but becomes brave in order to stop the dragon Hoptail. Chapter 2 moves on to the Great Bodley Tree, where Mario and Madame Flurry have to help the Punies where their confrontation of the Shadow Sirens lies. Chapter 3 is probably the weakest chapter in my opinion, since it involves competing in the Glitch Pit, and you have to go into battle 20 times, which does affect the pacing of the chapter. Yoshi Kid was probably the best part of the whole chapter, and Rock Hawk was a fun character as well. I just think that the gameplay loop affected the pacing of this chapter. Chapter 4 is probably my favourite of the chapters, not just because Vivian was the partner introduced in this chapter, but because it adds an extra layer of challenge having to go around to guess the name of Doppelganger Mario, which ends up being Dupless. Chapter 5 involves travelling to Keelhole Key, where you team up with Barbary to uncover the secrets of Cortez's treasure. Chapter 6 is probably another favourite chapter of mine, since this one is a whodunit kind of story to protect the Garnet Star. Chapter 7 is where you find the final star in the game, which this chapter involves going to Far Outpost, where you get blasted to the moon, which is where the x naught Fortress is located. And chapter 8 is the final chapter where you enter the Thousand Year Door, which leads you to the Palace of Shadow, where Mario needs to overcome trials to defeat the Shadow Queen. While the writing does stay true to the original game, there are changes in the writing, since it has been changed to stay true to the Japanese release of the Thousand Year Door. In terms of changes, the underground Goombas no longer can't call Goombella and Vivian in Chapter 4, is now canonically transgender. Those are the only changes I can notice within the writing. I want to talk about the changes made to the remake from the GameCube original. The Battle Master is a useful feature because it can help you master particular moves and can provide tips based on partner abilities. The Purple Toad can be found anywhere within the game's map. A fast travel system has been added into each location, similar to the Origami King, where you have different pipes inside Toad Town's museum, which aren't unlocked based on the story, but you have to find the pipes and remove the stickers from them, which should unlock the, the fast travel pipes, but in the Thousand Year Door, there is a room below Rogue Pot, which shouldn't open new pipes if you hold the stars at the thousand year door. Vivian is now canonically a trans woman in the remake since the Japanese version she was always portrayed as a trans woman but in the Nintendo Switch remake it does finally confirm that Vivian is a trans woman through one piece of dialogue which has been changed from the original game. The partner wheel is a useful change because it allows you to swap partners easily without having to open up the menu and change your partner, which is a time-saving feature 
and I think this is a feature that will return in the remake of Paper Mario 64. The soundtrack of the game has been rearranged. Every song in the game uses new instruments, which make it sound better to listen, and some new tracks have also been composed as well, such as the battle themes being different depending on the location, such as the spooky theme for Twilight Town and a rock theme for Glitzville. But if you prefer the original GameCube soundtrack, you can obtain the Nostalgic Tunes badge, which will change all of the music in the game to the GameCube original version. The only downgrade to this is the music variety in the remake soundtrack. The art and sound galleries can be unlocked with star pieces and shines brights you find around the map. The art gallery can allow you to get a brief idea on what developers were trying to do with the game and the sound gallery allows you to listen to music throughout the game, even with the Nostalgic Tunes badge equipped, but you are losing the newly arranged tracks if you're doing it. Even though I would have preferred a museum style feature as seen in the Origami King, which would allow you to view character models as well, the art and sound galleries are a great addition to the remake. And I do think we have great changes made in the remake, and I do think some of them, like the partner wheel and the galleries, will carry over to the remake of Paper Mario 64, and hopefully the next original Paper Mario game. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Doors 2024 remake has done it. It has earned the certified gold perk, just like the original game. All the Paper Mario games may not get there like the Thousand Year Door and its remake, but as the 18th spot in the certified gold club, I think it's well deserved. And overall, I give the remake of Paper Mario Thousand Year Door a 10 out of 10. It took me a while to beat compared to other Mario games because of college and stuff, but I've, I've now finished for the summer, so now I'm able to, to, to make more videos again, but I can safely say for now that Paper Mario is back and in the certified gold club as well and i hope that the future of paper mario ex is exactly what the thousand year door has demonstrated for us so guys what do you think of my review of the remake of paper mario the thousand year door my review for luigi's mansion 2 hd will be coming in July only because only because it was shown that no new content was added into the HD remaster so I'm probably gonna wait until the price drops a bit and then I'll pick up the game so don't forget to subscribe to my channel like this video and turn your notification bell on so you don't miss another video like this one and i will see you all in a future video bb8 out